two, one. All right, we're live with Clifford Starks. Clifford Starks, tell everyone who you are. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am a person who has had big dreams and helped other people accomplish their big dreams. I know when we go through this life, um, we want to do big things. And I think it gets beaten out of us. And I'm the person, instead of beating it out of you, I beat it into you in a good way. <laughs> well, you great. That's great. And I'm Theo Chino. Maybe I need a beat down like that. <laughs> it's the best kind of beat down you can have. You know, it's funny. So let's talk about beat down. So Clifford Starks, you pro MMA fighter, UFC octagon experience, business world now, me never made it that far in the MMA world, was just a champion in a local tournament so long ago that even I forget. And then in the business world, been in HR over 20 years, MBA, um, all these other, I'm part of all these bar associations now, used to be a teacher as well. And here we are, and let's talk about B-Towns. They don't have to be the real kind. A lot of people, when they start training martial arts, they start training for the wrong reasons. I am one of those people. Okay? I started training when I was 9 or 10 years old. I saw Bruce Lee, and I was going to be the little Mediterranean version of him. I was just going to go around just, you know, like, I was just pictured like 30 guys in a circle around me, and they'd all attack me one at a time, right? Just like Bruce Lee in the movies. How about you, Clifford? So let's talk about people start martial arts thinking all kinds of reasons, right? Some people are like, yeah. I just want to get in shape. It's something different. I hear it's a great way to lose weight. <clears throat> Other people say, I want to know what to do when the time comes to defend myself. Other people say, um, you know, I want to be a, a UFC champion, right? So yeah. um, there, we could probably do lots of podcasts on real life practical applications of our martial arts and our martial training right but um yeah. did you see the video of the guy who announced that he was a brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt while he was getting i guess he was involved in an altercation that uh, he allegedly did not start that happened in uh, it got filmed in a coffee shop in new zealand uh um, yeah tell me what what did you see what did you see there what, what were your thoughts I saw one guy getting his ass handed to him and from a fighter's perspective. And um, I saw the other guy wishing he hadn't done what he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the whole premise was that this guy was there to compete in the tournament. And yeah. I think just from that alone, if you're looking for motive, if we're in the courtroom... And we're trying to find a way to prosecute this guy who ended up on top of this guy who looked like, I mean, basically it looked like one person was assaulting the other, didn't it? Yeah. So, um, and I'll kind of go into what I call attack jitsu, which is not real jujitsu, which is the gentle way of jujitsu. There, uh, I think a lot of people teach aggressive attack jitsu. Like one of their first lessons, they're just learning how to submit someone. And I'm like, you don't, yeah. you don't even know the basics of, keeping yourself alive and healthy while you're doing jujitsu. You don't know how to fall without breaking your wrist or your elbow. You don't know how to defend against these attacks that you're learning to do on defenseless people that don't know how to defend against them. Right. It's kind of all upside down. That's how I first learned jujitsu too, is like more of the attack style jujitsu. Like you're going to grab this person, take them down and you're going to make them tap out with an Americana or choke or something. Right. And yeah. then I realized after teaching my students, I'm like, well, they they don't need that at first. They need the defense to that first if they're training in any kind of decent pool of experienced people. Obviously, this man who was, I guess, homeless, according to authorities, had some mental health issues, who claimed that he needed money for his son. Now, that touched a deep spot for me. Right. Um, and he looked, I mean, he was acting a little crazy. I mean, even when the guy was sitting on his chest, you know, in what we call the mounted position in jujitsu, which scares non jujitsu practitioners, it's kind of weird sounding. Um, they, he's still talking smack from the bottom. I don't know if you saw that, but I did. I and did. The, yeah. the guy on top was talking calmly and just kind of documenting what happened, et cetera. Right. 
So yeah. um, motivation, I think him going there to compete, I don't think he was anywhere near thinking about getting into any kind of scrap with anybody else because he was focused on getting placed at the top of that podium. Yeah. So I would say motive, he had no motive to get in some kind of scrap with this guy. And then according yeah. to the story, the guy harassed him for money, said he needed money for his son, kept on harassing him. The guy kept on telling him to leave him alone. I don't know how that whole exchange went. You know, if it got kind of rude, if it got mean, I don't know how much money he wanted. And then maybe, you know, our guy Bauer, um, is it Bowers? Is that what his name was? Dan Bauer? Uh, I don't remember the yeah. name. All right. I don't know if our guy, was, you know, he's, he's from America. He, uh, our American hero, you know, if he got kind of rude with them and kind of made him more angry or whatever, but he tried everything to get away from this guy. And then he went and he asked tons of people to call the authorities, nowhere to be found. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So <laughs> it's like, where's the cop when you need one? So, um, then he, um, goes in the coffee shop and then that part wasn't recorded, but he said he blast double legged him. Right. And then the part the, of the video that came in was he was already past the guy's guard. The guy probably didn't even know how to defend himself from his back. Right. And then, uh-huh. and then he's holding him down. The guy turns his back, he takes his back. And then some, some like really soft looking dude comes in and tries to act like he's trying to help. And he pulls this guy who's trying to control the, the crazy guy off of him. I'm sorry. He was acting crazy. No offense to crazy people. And then he ends up on the bottom. He does a body lock on him. He's announcing his rank. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And then he, then the video cuts out. But then he says that he choked the guy unconscious. All right, what do you think on that? I mean, was that an excessive use of force out of a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt? Um, I, I think it was the situation for what it needed to be. Um, I do believe it doesn't take a lot to choke a person unconscious. So I know no one got to see what was happening, but it really doesn't take much. I I've choked people unconscious and I'm not even trying. It's, it's just getting those carotid arteries right and pinching off that blood. And so it can, it can happen relatively quickly, actually. Um, and I feel there, there's a lot of learning lessons through through this entire thing, personally. Like, there, there's a, a mentally ill person from what I'm seeing, from what I was gathering, right. uh, who needed support. And, you know, wrong place, wrong time uh, with a pursuing jiu-jitsu black belt. And You know what? I'm going to challenge you on that. Maybe wrong mm-hmm. place. Uh, maybe wrong place, wrong time. Definitely not the wrong person, because if you're going to get into a scrap with someone, you know, if that could have been a K1 fighter, that guy might be dead, right? The K1 fighter might have been scared and kicked him in the head and hurt him, killed him, versus, okay, you've got a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt who knows more gentle control techniques and choking someone to civilians out there who don't train MMA, martial arts, Mm -hmm who don't know, especially even if you know martial arts, but you don't know submission grappling, especially Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Choking someone is very scary to people who don't know Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's even scary to those that do know it. But choking someone can be a controlled tactic or a controlled technique that you use. And I know that most law enforcement is not allowed to use a chokehold, right? So, yeah. um, because it's like, they call it like a deadly use of force. And I'm thinking, okay, but they're allowed to thump you with a baton or something like that. They're allowed to tase you. They're allowed to beat you in the head, which I think to me is possibly way more deadly than just applying a nice carotid choke, not too long. Right. And just yeah. making them go to sleep because they could be on all kinds of crazy drugs. And if you just cut the blood flow off to the brain, they'll go to sleep. Um, yeah, it, it's um, it's interesting because if you take if you take that situation, uh, there's a lot of things that can be bad and considered deadly force, and there's a lot of things that could be considered uh, gentle. Like even 
you take a K1 fighter who is a a kinder, I guess would be the best way to put it, and they kick you in the leg so that you just, like, you get kicked in the leg once or twice, you're you're not being combative anymore. You're on the ground. <laughs> well, and then there was this video I saw of some big, gigantic dude, and I think it was in the UK, and they were yeah. beating him with sticks in the legs, and they were hitting him everywhere. They sprayed pepper spray. He just kept walking. I don't know what he was on. Maybe the guy had no nerves or no feeling, right? Because, yeah, yeah if you eat one of those leg kicks, ooh. And if they if they really mean and they hit you in the side of the knee, ooh. I mean, yeah. Could be, yeah. you're done for life, depending on how they get you, right? And, and, and yeah, that's – so you're right in the fact, like, being the black belt, he's controlled, and he was in control of the situation. And – what I like being is the one who can control the situation the best. Yeah. So under the circumstances, wrong place, wrong time, but right person, you know, right person to not take his head off, not, not brutally hurt him in a way that he's, he's not going to ever be the same, but calm the situation down and, and calm him down enough to where he can't hurt him or anybody around him. Right, and it's easy to Monday morning quarterback what Bowers did, right? I mean, he was kind of just minding his business, and all of a sudden, things just got crazy, and he kind of went to what he knew. Yeah. Right? And that's kind of what we'll all do. I mean, you don't really know what you're going to do when just random, just wild stuff starts happening around you. Some people have the instinct to run at it and go nuts. And some people, most people, I would hope, have the instinct to run away from whatever craziness is going on. Some people just sit there and freeze, right? Yeah. And yeah. when I'm mentally overwhelmed, I'll stop and I'll get really quiet. Um, it kind of depends on my mood and I guess maybe my individual natural hormone levels that day and what else is going on with me, right? But most of the time when I'm mentally or emotionally overwhelmed, I get really quiet. Mm-hmm. And And it depends on who's around and what's going on, right? Now, if you know, if you're a father and you have children around, I mean, think about this too. This guy, this other guy, whether the story was true or not, he was technically in there fighting for his son. If the story's true. Uh-huh. And this other guy's like, Hey, I don't want, I don't know you. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want to fight you. So, um, whole different set of motivations there too. One of the best stories I ever heard was there was this big guy. We call him Timmy T and he was on every steroid you could name. And he just looked like, when he'd walk into the gym, it'd be like the T-Rex coming, you know, the, the glass of water with the, you'd see like the ripples in the glass of water. And he'd walk in and just, he'd never pay for his gym membership, ever. And he'd be like, yeah, brother, what's up? Slamming, brother. And he's like a WWF back in the day character, right? And everybody was just, he was like nice, but he was scary. So what are you going to do? Who's going to make him pay his membership, right? So they had this new manager, Bill. And he had his hair in like this little Steven Seagal ponytail. He said he did Aikido. And he goes, hey, Mr. Mr. Uh, Timmy T, could you come on over here for a second? He's like, what's up, brother? He's like, listen, you're way behind. You owe us like $870 or something, right? Uh-huh. At this gym yeah. where the membership was super cheap. And he's like, what? He's like, how dare you? Don't you know I bring people in this place? And then next thing you know, he's like, he's like, you don't know what you got here, buddy. He's like, listen, you got to leave. He's like, you got to pay your bill. He goes, if you pay your bill, you're welcome to come in here. You have to leave otherwise. He's like, let's let's go, brother. Let's go. I'm going to smash you into dust. And he's like, you know what? Fine. Yeah. And I'm like, and I heard, I just heard about this. I didn't see the incident. But, you know, he's like, okay, Aikido versus a big steroid monster goon. Okay. So uh, he goes, he goes, you want to take this outside? He's like, yeah, I'd love to. And he holds the door open for Timmy T. Timmy T goes, boom, 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 storming out. He closes the door and locks the door and calls the police. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, now Bowers, this is the thing, Brazilian jiu-jitsu training is great, right? It learns, it teaches you how to uh, deal with stress and pressure and uh, what to do when you mess up and how to recover. Awesome. And there's really good techniques and good framing in there really good self-defense if you train it correctly. I think most people doing sport BJJ today do not. 
train jujitsu correctly for real situations and real fights against a real savage. <clears throat> but he had all the tools in his toolbox to yeah. deal with this guy. Great. But then there's the whole, like, you know, I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to inter- interact with someone who's acting crazy. And maybe he really had no choice. Like the guy was yeah. just all over him. So then there's that whole the psychological level and the de-escalation level and everything else, right? Including I've had people attack me and I've just kind of like just kind of held on to them and let them think they're getting somewhere until they just kind of gassed out. And then I just kind of squirm out from underneath them sometimes and kind of control them a little bit. It really didn't take much once they were gassed out. Like I didn't have, I've never choked someone unconscious. I'm actually afraid to do that to somebody because there are risks, right? I mean, things could go wrong, like anything. Um, I've never been choked unconscious. I'm always like, nope, you got me. That's it. You know, I don't need to go to sleep to find out that I messed up five moves back. Um, But what other, like, real-life experiences have you seen or had with people? And I know we're trying to keep these short. I mean, we could do, like, a series of ten of these um, we got another 10 minutes if you want us to kind of stay in our range here. What other experiences yeah. have you had personally or have you watched that where you had someone who was, I mean, it could have been two skilled fighters in a real altercation. It could have been one that wasn't, one that was, two unskilled fighters, which are hilarious fights to watch, and deadly. Um, go ahead, talk. Go ahead. Tell me, what, tell me what you've seen. I mean, I have seen so many things, but I – I do want to introduce a concept for us. Yeah. Um, and it really kind of stems from this, this black belt and this uh, apparently homeless guy. Right. And have, have you heard of power versus force? Power versus force. I've heard of the terms. I haven't heard them pitted against okay. each other like that. So this is good. So there's actually a book on this. And it talks about... Um, kinesthetic like kinesthetic energy and how we all are forms of energy and power which is being empowered being courageous feeling feeling a certain way about a situation versus force force is is it's got to run through you it's got to destroy you it's got to it's me versus you it's very I, I i actually like this because it's Using the word competitive, right? Right. Competitive can be in power or force. If you're competitive in a forceful way, you have to dominate the opposition. You got to run through them. You got to destroy them. If you're competitive in a powerful way, you're you're looking to be your best you, your best self, showing up your best, regardless of what happens in the situation. And I look at this, and I go, okay, it is it's so important to, to practice power over force because this guy, for instance, I don't know the, all the data behind the situation, but let's say instead of doing what he did, maybe he, he attacked him because he saw that he was an American person. That's the only, that's the only thing that I can think of. Why, why was he so targeted towards this individual? That's the only thing I can think of. Especially somebody, I mean, this guy looks kind of jacked and he's got cauliflower ears. I mean, it's like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was just, it was a really, really dangerous situation. And now I'm not going to say, oh, he has his wits about him and he should figure out the best way to approach this. But here's another approach that could be used. Instead of, hey, you're going to give me money. I got to take care of my son. Sir, um, I know you're probably a busy man. I just wanted to know, would you be open to, and I'm kind of spitballing at the moment, would you be open to uh, giving me $10, $15 to support my son? Tell your story and share your story. And then the person has the option to say yes or no. And then leave it as that. Right. And, you, you know, you'll see, I, I actually know someone who panhandles and sells their plasma to keep themselves mm-hmm. alive right now. And mm-hmm. they're on this, this search for justice in the legal system. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. it's not possible, but 
it's definitely not possible quickly. And this person is homeless and they're panhandling. And um, he gets all kinds of reactions from people. Now, I did hear a story. You talk about power versus force again. And you talk about just this different way to spitball and interact. I heard a story where a, a homeless person was holding a sign up saying, I'm hungry, out in front of this really richy, rich, ritzy restaurant and wasn't getting very far. And I guess some, um, like your Tony Robbins type or something like that, some influencer person goes up and goes, hey, before we go in the restaurant, hang on a second. He walks over to the homeless guy. They think that he, he's going to give them money. He's like, listen, I'm going to give you something better than money. Turn your sign around. And he, he's like, where's your marker? And he writes something on the sign. And, and then he says, hold that up instead and tell me when I come out afterwards what the result was. This guy made more money panhandling or begging for food, money, whatever, look, you know, asking for help with what he had on the other part of the sign. So on one part of the sign, it said, I'm hungry, right? On the other side of the sign, when he turned it over, it said, what if you were hungry right now? Uh -huh. And people were like, yeah able to empathize with him because this guy that I know the panhandle, he gets off, get a job, you loser, you bum. And the guy looks great. He is like in phenomenal shape. When you see him panhandling, you're like, what's that guy doing panhandling? He is, yeah. he's emotionally, mentally, and really right now, legally destroyed. And not really justifiably so from the best that I can tell, because I've been kind of following his legal path and all of his his court appearances and things like that too so it's just funny to see the reactions that people give him you know get a job you loser you look fine you know what you can go scrub toilets i mean he's heard all kinds of stuff and then some people are like what happened to you what's going on well you know the court system and blah 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 it's like, oh man that sucks here you go right so yeah big range there now, so e even so. with what you're saying, and this is what I love about it, um, fairness will never and always exist at the same time. Correct. Yeah. You know, I always, you, when I was a teacher, when I was a high school teacher, I was like, Mr. Chino, that's not fair. I'm like, you just used the F word. What? I'm like, fair? I go, there's those, I go, listen, your version of fair is different than their version of fair, different than my version of fair. It kind of exists, but we need to sit down and agree what's fair first. And then guess what? The next minute, we could all be out of alignment again on what's fair. Because yeah. something changed, including, I don't know, my mood. Like, I don't feel like living like that anymore. It's like, yeah. oh, not fair anymore. Not fair for me. So, yeah, fair. The F word, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> Four letter, yep. four letters starts with the letter F, right? You shouldn't say it. I mean, it's funny because when you say the word fair, it's like, that's not fair. It's like, what? oh, here we go. This is going to be very extensive. I mean, I have, I have children that sometimes do not agree on things and, you know, whose shirt belongs to whom or whose socks or whose or whatever, right? And yeah. I'm like, okay, let's sit down and talk. They're like, no. This is worse punishment than me not getting the socks. Like, yeah. I, 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 would, go ahead. I, I would say the only time I would use the word fair is when you're saying, does that sound fair? Yeah, because you're asking the other person, right, to tell you yeah. what their perception of fairness is. So now going back to the coffee shop incident in New Zealand, so the guy, you know, allegedly was attacking him. All right. You have somebody who's attacking you, who's obviously unskilled, doesn't, you know, I mean, a lot of these people who don't know how to fight, I mean, most of them couldn't just stand up without tripping over their own feet a lot of times when they're in a real fight. You're watching people who don't know how to fight, like they don't even know how to stand right. They'll trip over their feet. They'll kind of overextend their weight and fall over themselves. I watched a lot of bar fights, you know, in my twenties, I got my PhD in bar hopping and I would just watch idiots who had drank too much go at it with each other and just the lack of stance and balance just ended the fight usually right including now you have alcohol involved but they they didn't even know how to do, every once in a while you're like oh he played football okay like he knows how to like drive into the other person and drive them backwards oh oh that guy wrestled you know 
oh my gosh, that guy boxed. This is a massacre right now, right? And it's like, here we go. But in that situation, blast double leg in a coffee shop. If you could rewind and do it differently, is there something better he could have done? Not criticizing him because he just made the best moves he could at the moment with what he had. I don't think so. Like, under that circumstance, it's it's kind of a fight or flight situation. So, um, but yeah, you're going to resort. I, I think he handled it, for, to me, perfectly for the situation. Well, and remember, it's, it's like blast double leg. All right, so I'm asking you specifically about a blast double leg against some wild, oh. savage in, in a place where there's there are no mats on the ground. I mean, could there have been something better to do or go for if you, if you could not get out of there and run away? You know, and so if if we're talking about like in a perfect perfect world, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rewind and they go. Okay, you have any move you want. Which one would you rather use? Yeah, like probably a, a duck under. It, it, well, it it depends on your intention too. If your intention is I'm going to hurt this guy. It's the last double leg would be perfect. <laughs> if your intention is, I want to lay this guy down gently, it's probably going to be like a duck under, and then you, you pin his hips down, and, and you, bring, you bring him down to the ground in, in a very gentle way. Yeah, so see, now you're thinking, because you, you got to think about, I mean, after it's over, and I, I know like a couple of instances where um, after bar, bar brawls ended in someone dying, and then the other person had to explain themselves, and it didn't go well. Um, yeah. So, last double. For me, why I wouldn't do that in the street is um, usually the way most wrestlers do blast doubles and BJJ guys and whatever is you're leading with your face. Your hands are wide open because you're trying to catch the outside of their thighs, right? Mm-hmm. What could go wrong there? It's like... There have been tons of Brazilian jiu-jitsu superstars who got in the ring or the cage, and they were knocked out in seconds. Ben Askren. Yeah. Right? Versus Masvidal. Yeah. He showed us what's wrong with the blast double, right? I mean, he was running full force at this guy with his face first. So you could catch him. Yeah, that that was... um... That would never happen with a homeless guy, though. <laughs> well, you, you never know because different people have different instincts, right? He, I've had people spaz out on me when I'm just demonstrating a move, and they, uh, they've clipped me in the chin. Like, when I'm just kind of showing something slowly, they've kind of spa- – they had that instinct to, like – a lot of people know, like, when your head's down there, I can just knee you, right? Now, would he have the, the precision and the timing to pull that? Most likely, no. But you know what? People win the lottery, too, right? So yeah. I would not lead with my face. Um, I have another, it's kind of a, what I do is I, I do this, we call it the distraction in the kids class warm up. You're clapping their face to get them all crazy and swinging up top or defending themselves. And then you go down either for, you know, like a double, but I do one where I have a, a hand in front of my face while I'm going down for a single and uh-huh. it will block that lucky spaz knee or maybe an uppercut or something else that might hit me in the face and knock me out until I can make contact with that leg. And then I'll, then I'll make contact with the leg. Then I'll climb up kind of like you were describing a duck under. And then yeah. if I get behind them when they're standing, what I teach my students is to uh, spread your legs out nice and wide behind them. Keep your head in their back so they can't elbow you in the face. Cause they will, you know, it's just, it's like dumb luck, right? First, you know, uh-huh. beginner's luck. And then I will tell them to, um, like you're hiking a football, but you're kind of like hiking their butt down to the ground. Right. Uh-huh. Then nobody can get hurt. And then you seatbelt them. So Vitor Belfort used this against Tank Abbott, if I remember correctly. He kind of like had Vitor, uh, he had Tank on his butt and he's behind him. And he was kind of like, he kept him down where he couldn't turn around and face him. Vitor was kind of still standing up behind him. And then Vitor was <laughs> punching him in the face from behind until Tank just gave up. He just didn't know where. He could, didn't know how to get out of that, right? So you could pull them down on their butt and seatbelt them, pinch their hips with your knees so you can control their hips. And then they might probably try to, like, bunch their legs up and blast up backwards at you or something like that. You just kind of walk with them and drag their butt back down, right? And then, yeah. really, I mean, it's just such a 
you're just, you feel like a baby, like you can't do anything, right? And then yeah. you just hug them, tell them you love them, tell them it's over, all right, let's talk. You got to keep your eyes, you got to protect your eyes because they could l- get lucky and poke your eyes from, you know, you know, just lucky, like behind them, right? They might just poke your mm-hmm. eyes. So that's, in a perfect world, if I were thinking and I was in that coffee shop incident and I couldn't get out of there, that's what I would probably like to do to the guy. Um, I'm also glad that our fellow Patriot didn't sit down and butt scoot at the guy. So, uh, <laughs> that can get very bad in a real situation. <laughs> but oh, yeah. you know what's funny is even sitting down and butt scooting towards somebody and being all calm and having your arm up in front of you so they can't hit you, like, come on, dude, settle down. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, just the fact that you're down there like that, I mean, it's not good if you don't know who else is around, but that might really throw them off. It's like now it's like de-escalated all of the threat and the anger, you know, and it might entice them to try and jump on you. And then you hit a nice little butterfly sweep. That's the move of the week at UFC mm-hmm. Yorktown this week. Butterfly position, right? Um, but I've had one of my buddies who was one of my students before he became a black belt. He's a black belt now. He's awesome. I'm going to give a shout out to him. Adam Kim. He's got his dojo, his gym out in Indiana. Go visit him if you're near anywhere near like Northwest Indiana. Look up Adam Kim's gym. He had a situation where he was the leader of a youth group, um, Christian youth group. And this big guy didn't respect him. He was 18 and he was six foot two, 230 pounds. And Adam Kim is this uh, I don't know if he's like five five maybe tops. I know he's shorter than I am. He makes me feel tall. That's why I like hanging out with him. And <laughs> he is just a killer. He is just he's so strong and so good at jujitsu. And he was sitting down. He's like, "What are you gonna do if I jump on you right now? You're dead." And Adam probably weighs, you know, maybe one fifty tops, like walking around mm-hmm. super fat. And Adam's like, "That's not a good idea." He jumps on him, and, and uh, Adam I think hits a hundred percent sweep on him. Swept him, is on top of him. The guy turns his back. He's like, nah, let's just get worse for you. And then the guy got all embarrassed, and he's like, I want to go again. He's like, let's go talk alone somewhere. He's like, why are you acting like this? This is a Christian young men's retreat. He's like, he's like that's it. And he attacks him again. And this, he's like, same thing. Just boring. <laughs> so boring. And so real, real fights, when you know how to fight, most of, I mean, they could get chaotic because you don't know if they have friends or weapons. You don't know. Sometimes just their moves are very unpredictable really kind of throw you off like, whoa, I haven't been headlocked in years. I mean, that's so dumb, but it almost worked because I wasn't ready for it, right? And Uh then, um, you know, it's just boring usually. You're like, really? Like, that's it? And then really, you could could hurt or even kill that person then. But the great part about jujitsu is that you have gentle options where you're still going to be okay. I don't condone laying there and getting beat to death because you don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings while they're trying to beat you to death. I, yeah. I'm not there yet. <laughs> okay. Like somebody's got to explain to me why that's a good move. All right. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, but, and I'm not okay with even getting hurt even the tiniest bit, but if I have to get hurt a little bit to prevent someone else from dying now, that's big. Right. But uh-huh. I always tell people like, if somebody's got to get hurt, it's, I hope it's going to be you and not me. <laughs> that's kind of how where I'm at, right? And it's not about winning the fight or looking dominant or whatever, right? It's just like I don't want anybody to die or get hurt, especially me, uh-huh. right? And that's kind of yeah. like the angle I come at. So um, I think this is – we could really run away with this because, believe it or not, I have had episodes of um, threats of violence – and episodes of real violence, even involving motor vehicles at work. I know someone who was the victim of a mass shooting out at Northern Illinois University years and years ago. He trained uh-huh. with me for a while and told me about that experience. We could talk a lot about how the martial arts will not protect you from everything, everywhere, always against everyone. But it's a huge, great tool, not just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual and psychological and emotional sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can, we can talk for hours, but I'll give everybody a teaser. I was telling this guy at my gym who had just accepted a new position. 
And he's like, I'm going into corporate finance. I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, good, good for you. You know, and he, he's like this big guy who likes to lift weights. He's never trained jujitsu as far as I know. And I said, well, congratulations. I go, hey, just so you know, even though you're in corporate, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to behave themselves. I've been in HR for over 20 years. And I told him about my first day in corporate ever when I was in my 20s and I was a blue belt in jujitsu. I was like, this looks like no one in my dojo ever acted this inappropriate. And it was my first day in corporate. VP of, eight, of um, sales mm-hmm. walks into a room and <coughs> verbally and physically terrorizes everybody in the room. Now, I wasn't part of his team. And I just, I'm like, well, I'm just going to mind my own business. Nope. He had to come up to me and interact with me like that too. So we'll leave that as a teaser for next week. But do you have any okay. last thoughts about, um, like our topic was really kind of about what happened to Mr. Bowers out in New Zealand, but bigger topic, you know, how you handle situations maybe outside of the ring, which is kind of most of what you do, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I, what I do like about where this is going, um, leading into power versus force and saying, okay, what are the best options to take so that I can effectively win in the game of life? Because ultimately that's all we're looking for when we really think about it. We want to win. We want to win at our life. Right. Yeah. And for me, winning is when everybody else around me is at least okay, if not doing better since I was around them. Right. So, and we've talked about that, right? What is winning for you, right? Like, Mm -hmm. what does winning look like to you? And you're right. I mean, winning at life. And it's like, you could could have every toy. You could have everything and win all the time. But if you're lonely, you don't have anybody to play with or share all that with. I mean, that's kind of sad, you know? Yep. And I was a, you know, I was the firstborn. So I was an only child for like four years. And I still yeah. almost remember that loneliness feeling. I wanted a little brother. I kept on asking for a little brother, you know. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. well, I was granted my wish, and I'm very glad I was, right? Um, yes. This is interesting. So, like, how do you um, how do you win at life? And using the power versus force thing, because when you said the word force um, and power, I actually got it wrong. I have a negative connotation. Well, I got it wrong compared to where you were going with it. I have a negative Mm -hmm. connotation with the word force. And depending on who it is that has the power, I also have a negative connotation with the word power, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm always looking for that bully who's going to take things too far. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients in Colorado was called by the local law enforcement because he had an exchange with his co-parent that said that he was under no circumstance going to allow her to limit their son's time with his father anymore. And at one point he said, I will apply whatever I, and I don't quote me on this, but he said something to the effect of, I will apply the appropriate level of force to stop our son from being abused and being deprived of equal time with both of his parents. Mm -hmm. And that, according to what you were saying earlier, could be interpreted as something very scary, right? Yeah. So the police called him up and talked to him. Fun fact for all of our listeners. If you're ever talking to law enforcement, your first question to them before answering their questions is, are you allowed to lie to me during the course of this investigation if it is one? And then you say, stop, I'll answer for you. No, and wink at them, right? Because Mm -hmm. they're allowed to lie. This um, person picked up the phone and was told he had a warrant out for his arrest and that he should come into the station and turn himself in. He said, I will call my lawyer up and I will get back to you. As soon as they heard the word lawyer, They got much more respectful, and surprise, surprise, there was no warrant out for him. So power, force, see, I feel like that's an abuse of power, right? Because I understand why judges and police officers need some type of immunity from frivolous lawsuits. I get that. 
but then you have the abuse of power. So teaser for next week, my first day in corporate and uh, any last wrap up words for every, all of our listeners, Clifford. Yeah, let's keep moving forward people. And um, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, find me on Facebook or my LinkedIn page under Clifford Starks. And I appreciate y'all. Love you, Clifford. Love you guys out there. Thanks for listening. All right. Love you, brother. Have a great one. Take care.